So hello everybody, uh, my name is Nikita and I'm a part of Datart team for more than two years and uh, most time here I work with the uh, serverless architecture and AWS Lambda. So from the very beginning I would like to start with what exactly is serverless architecture. So it's a new way of um, thinking when you build your services and first it consists of three parts. First part is event source, which produces events. And then you have your Lambda function with all your logic. For example, you compute something or transform your data. And the third part are services which you use inside your Lambda code. Let's talk about what happened when event occurs. So first, your cloud provider starts um, reacting on event. It urgently allocate all useful resources, which are listed in your Lambda function options. Then upload Lambda code and start Lambda execution with event as an input data. From the event till Lambda execution start, cloud provider um, spend a bunch of time. For non-VPC Lambdas, this time is uh, 300 to 800 milliseconds, and uh, for lambdas inside VPC, it's from one to two seconds. And then your lambda executes, and when your execution ends, your lambda stays in a warm, something like warm state. And now let's stop and discuss what is warm state. So warm state is when your lambda is already deployed, uh, not, not deployed, but uploaded, on cloud provider and uh, all resources are allocated and lambda is ready to react on new events immediately this warm period is used to reduce a um, number of uh, useless time at when uh, cloud provider start reacting on event also warm period is a bit different for lambdas in non-VPC, it's five minutes. For lambdas inside custom VPC is uh, 15 minutes. And I'll return to this uh, in the next slide. And when warm period uh, happened, if your event, uh, if new event comes, then we go back to state three, start execution, execute our lambda and start a new warm period. But if we have no other events, our Lambda code gets removed from a uh, cloud provider. So why we love serverless architecture? The first one, you don't need to manage your server. You don't need to pay attention on op operation system updates or any software updates. Lambda is really scalable. Um, so when you have uh, lots of requests, for example, spikes, you uh, your cloud provider will run multiple lambdas in parallel you also pay only while your code runs so if you have some time with lots of activities or maybe some time without any activity uh, in the night you will pay only when your lambda runs and will not pay when you have no activity so, and also as i've already discussed um, our cloud provider will run our code in response to events. That's why you don't need to have something like service which are running uh, 24 hours per day and just react on events. There are plenty of cloud providers. Um, most popular are Amazon Web Services and Google Cloud Platform, but you could use uh, any of them. I mostly worked with Amazon Web Services and uh, tr also tried uh, Google Cloud Platform. That's why uh, our next slide will be built on top of AWS Lambda. So there are a bunch of uh, event sources for our Lambda from notification so services to some IoT services and from uh, data streams to um, HTTP requests. That's why we have a lot of ability to uh, create our services 
uh, and work with uh, lots of different stuff. Inside our Lambda, we could access any AWS service using uh, uh, AWS SDK, which uh, is implemented for almost every language uh, which is supported by Lambda itself. If we have a new service, we have a bunch of tips for it. And the first and uh, maybe the most important tip is a nonlinear relation between memory allocation, execution time, and price. For example, you have your small Lambda with 128 megabytes, which executes uh, almost 12 seconds and uh, costs not so much for you. But you want to decrease the execution time. So it's highly recommended to change a bit your settings. And uh, sometime it, this data is completely experimental. So you could have another results with your Lambda, but sometime, for example, when you increase in this example, um, memory allocation to 1024 megabytes, you'll get a huge, almost 10 times uh, better execution time, but your cost uh, will not be uh, much more bigger than for 128 megabytes. Also, our other Lambda tips are um, using Lambdas in VPC. Often people um, create custom VPCs for their Lambdas, which is uh, not good because um, it forces AWS to make additional security checks when uh, your event happened. That's why, uh, as we've seen already, Lambda uh, inside VPCs uh, need to spend more time to be loaded. And at the same time, this problem is compensated by uh, Amazon with more longer uh, warm-up period. Also, if you have uh, your function with memory allocated more than uh, 1.8 gigabytes, you will have an access to um, multi-core execution. Now it works with uh, multi-core languages such as Java, for example. But as we have already heard, probably in the future, Node will also um, have uh, direct access to multi-core executions. The next tip is Lambda warming. And it's uh, commonly used. For example, you could, uh, uh, the idea is to keep Lambda inside warm-up period and uh, don't give a cloud provider a chance to remove your code. You could do it with uh, CloudWatch events or probably with prior options requests if your Lambda is built on as a REST service. Also, one of the common issues in Tidal Code is bad event filtering. Sometimes you use one SNS topic as a message broker and lots of lambdas um, subscribe on it. And uh, it's commonly used in the code that you make filtering just with if-else statements. For example, if type of event is event from IoT device, then execute Lambda, otherwise stop execution. But it's not good because uh, Cloud Provider will need time to load your Lambda and also execute it. That's why for this, you should use SNS filters. And also, for example, if your Lambda reacts on some update, uh, file uploads inside S3 bucket, you could use uh, prefixes in S3 file names. And also one nice tip is uh, usage of DLQ and X-Ray. DLQ is a short version of dead letter Q and it's a Q built on top of SKS, which Lambda could use to put all errors inside. So using DLQ, you'll get an access to data, for example, input, which came to Lambda stack trace and so on, which you could use to troubleshoot errors. And X-Ray is a nice service inside uh, Amazon, which you can use to gather and visualize metrics. 
There are two main uh, frameworks for development of serverless functions on JavaScript. First one is Claudia.js, and second one is serverless platform. You could also use uh, plain JavaScript, but if you begin uh, working with uh, serverless architecture, it's recommended to use one of these two frameworks because um, it will be much more easier for you to start with serverless development. So what is Claudia.js? It's a CLI tool which could be used for deployment and uh, management of multiple code versions. It works with AWS only and uh, with Node.js only. But at the same time, it can help you to build API and bots with such parts as Claudia API Builder and Claudia Bot Builder, respectively. The serverless platform consists of three parts. The first one is a framework itself, which you can use for development and deployment. The second part is event gateway, which could be used to trigger events and test your code additionally. And the third one is dashboard, which is something like um, built on top of X-Ray and could visualize a lot of metrics for your Lambda. It works with almost every cloud provider we have. And uh, you could also use Python as a language uh, for serverless development. It has YAML-based configs, which is useful for someone. But also, uh, if we return to Claudia.js, there were um, JSON-based configs over there. When we have a new view of architecture, we'll definitely have and new ideas of how malicious user could crack your service. That's why we need to pay attention on serverless security, because uh, often people think that if cloud provider do everything for us, it will handle security too. But it's not true. So here are the most uh, common groups of attacks we have now in our service architecture. The first one is execution flow manipulation. And here we have injections. Um, broken authentication and uh, manipulation with Lambda execution flow. So we know inj injections well from our microservices architecture and monolithic architecture. But as we have much more event sources than just an HTTP protocol, we should pay attention for uh, all the data coming from every service. Also, it's a common error when People have something like Lambda pipeline and check authentication only on the front Lambda. We need to check authentication on every Lambda because if the first one will be corrupted, malicious user could do everything with your architecture. The second group is insecure configuration. And uh, also people think that cloud provider will configure everything for you, but it's not true and sometimes you need to additional configuration that's why you need to keep secrets and some useful uh, for example uh, urls to your other services and you need to keep it secretly that's why it's nice to use aws system manager parameter store which works nice with aws kms and encrypt every secret you put inside the third group is really um, famous for us, also from microservices and monolithic architecture, is insecure third-party dependencies. For example, previously, and I suppose now, we still have a lot of um, modules in, in NPM, which names are really close to popular models. For example, Mongoose and Mongoose. And if you make a typo, you will get not just useful, but also malicious functionality. That's why you should pay attention for this. Previously, we had NSP, a node security project, but currently we can use Sneak as a plugin for uh, and which works nice with GitHub, for example. And also, you could just run npm audit every time you try to commit and deploy your code. The next group is resource exhaustion, and here we have something like DOS attacks. We already have them in microservices architecture, but um, 
here in serverless architecture, we have same problem. And also, your uh, as you have more event sources, your malicious user could, uh, for example, load a huge amount of uh, files or a big file to your S3 bucket, for example, if your function reacts on S3 bucket uploads and make something like a DOS attack. Even if your architecture won't have a downtime, you'll definitely get a huge bill from Amazon at the end of the month. And the last but not least problem is uh, inadequate error handling and logging. Often our logs are not good and you have only a small amount of data inside them. But also often we have a huge mess inside our logs. That's why um, at the end of um, this talk, I'll share a bunch of links. And inside one of them, you can find a list of points where you could pay attention to your login and try to log your data with uh, more, uh, more carefully. And also, sometimes we need to write code fast and then pay attention to proper error handling. And then we forget about this. And sometimes our user could get not just a um, problematic er uh, error message, but also such things as stack traces, which could give additional information. Oh. Sorry. Yeah which could give additional information about your system for attacker. Here are useful links. Um, the, uh, I'll share a presentation at the end, so uh, you'll be able to check them. These links are to serverless uh, frameworks. Also, a very nice article by Jeremy Daly about limited tips, and also I recommend uh, checking his blog. And the last article uh, link is a link to Solar Security Doc, but also we have additional Solar Security Doc made by OWASP group uh, last week. So I hope this uh, talk was interesting for you. If you have any questions, feel free to ask. Oh, yeah. Oh. Yes. Okay. Uh, so I would like to ask you for advice. Let's say that we have some services or a group of microservices with a well-defined defi uh, API, and we would like to uh, make it serverless. Let's say we have those uh, Node.js services. So uh, would it would be better to just uh, move some functionalities piece by piece or rewrite it from, from scratch or plan it uh, completely new, define it completely new? Actually, the code inside the Lambda uh, would not be really different from the code you have inside your microservices architecture. For example, some, I don't know, Docker-based application. That's why um, it doesn't matter what you will do. You probably could start um, migrating uh, your code piece by piece to check how it works with Lambda and API Gateway because you definitely will need API Gateway. But uh, at the same time, if you think that you could do this in one time, it's okay. Lambda code is almost the same as the code you write every time. Any more questions? Oh, yeah. Could it Pass the microphone somehow. Uh, I have two questions. So first question, uh, you told that whenever Lambda finishes execution, it go to its cold period or yeah. something like this. Uh, are we paying for that cold period or this? No, uh, we don't pay for this period. It's just a uh, time when uh, AWS keep our code inside their resources okay so uh how they determine that this lambda finished their execution 
that this is the time when it can leap into growth period? Uh, actually, inside your Lambda code, uh, you'll just uh, so in JavaScript and in all other languages, lam uh, the most important method in Lambda called handler. And when execution of this method ends, AWS or any other cloud provider decided that the ex Lambda execution ends and uh, put Lambda inside a uh, warm period. Okay, so after the handler is finished, the code is actually not working. It's just yeah. loaded in some Yeah, memory. it's just loaded and waiting for new requests. Okay, and second question as, uh, as uh, it was in the previous question about migration to serverless. Uh, yeah, the question is actually, is it possible to have all of our API, full, a full, a full backend API if it's not too complicated, based on serverless? Uh, yeah, it's uh, okay for you. But sometimes uh, serverless is not really good. For example, if you have your um, a huge activity inside your, your API, your Lambda function will be executed 24 hours per day. And that's why you won't have any... Uh, so the all nice things of Lambda won't work and you'll just return to a simple server. So if you have uh, a huge activity, it's better to not migrate to cells. Okay, thank you. Oh yeah, you're right. Because uh, currently, uh, API gateway have a limit for probably thirty seconds or maybe three minutes. I don't really remember the number of time, but um, this time is not configurable, and you could just leave uh, with it. That's why uh, for for most of work, or or if you don't need a response, because seven minutes is a huge time for your response and uh, your users will just <laughs> close your web page and go out. Uh, so that's why um, this limit is, uh, you could almost never reach it. And if uh, you use uh, REST API as a chart of uh, some background job, you don't need uh, a response. That's why you just fire request, start some job and uh, respond with uh, okay. Any more questions? Okay. Uh, uh, one, two, three, one, two, three, okay. Uh, you show uh, uh, Lambda functions. Uh, my question is about, um, because uh, for example, uh, there are some applications that, that probably uses this Lambda functions. Okay. And on a uh, general level, uh, those Lambda functions that are used in application, how they are organized um, within application? I mean, are there any design patterns that organize those functions? For example, it is better to create small, smaller uh, functions, uh, for example, in chain on one big function. On Are there yeah, any so, design patterns um, for building application using these functions? Yes. Yeah, so for Lambda function, uh, you um, could not uh, just think that Lambda function is one function itself. You could create models inside and uh, lots of files. But um, the most common pattern is same as you have in microservices. So if you have some activity or maybe a bunch of activities related to the same part of the data, you could uh, you create a one service outside of it. And inside of your architecture, your lambdas could be connected with uh, such thing as SNS or SKS, or at the same time as you have AWS SDK, you could uh, invoke your lambda directly on one function from another. 
So it just matter of uh, how you build your architecture and what you need. Okay. Okay. It, it depends on application yeah. and it is totally free to organize. Yeah. It. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Any more questions?